I thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you on a subject that's very near and dear to my company, AgriPath. Uh, our company spends a lot of time trying to understand farm business performance and particularly trying to link that with the physical decisions that people make and the impact that they have in the long run in terms of generating farm profitability uh, from in this year and, and in the following years as we go forward. I want to focus today partly on a really big topic, which when John gave it to me was a little bit daunting. And I'd have to say, when you start talking about yield and profit draggers and those sorts of things that are involved in farming, then there are probably a lot more qualified people in the room to talk about some of the issues that I'm going to touch on. But I really want to focus probably on the economic impact and the management impact that, uh, that is a resultant of what, when we look at farm performance, is a result of people making really good decisions and understanding their farming systems going forward. Firstly, I just want to acknowledge that some of this work is part of the uh, GRDC project, the economics that plays in the yield gap for the Northern Grains regions, which is really focusing on that, the economics of some of the issues or some of the profit draggers that we're going to focus on today in terms of what impact they have on farm profitability and trying to understand what they are and, 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 and provide some information to people to enable them to, to make better decisions going forward. And I also would like to acknowledge the work of my colleague uh, Peter Wiley from Dolby, who's spent a lot of hours uh, trolling through information through our benchmarking data um, across the region and uh, compiling a lot of the data that I'm going to present uh, today as we go forward. Some of the key messages today are quite simply that the gap between the average farm yields that are experienced and the attainable yields um, that we think are possible is upwards of 50 to 100 per cent. Now as an audience, uh, we all deal with farmers that are very good at what they do. Um, what we're focusing on here is actually what the average of the industry is trying to do and we acknowledge that there are farm businesses out there that are actually performing at a lot higher level than that. Uh, our focus is on trying to lift the entire industry averages up as we go forward. Secondly, I, I want to uh, focus on the fact that farm profits can be improved enormously um, if, we can, uh, if, if the yield can be improve, uh, improved over that period of time. And management has a key role in this. And as advisors, I believe that we are in a role, uh, each of us, to actually influence some of those outcomes. Uh, and that the main difference between the average and top farmers is that the uh, greatest incidence of problems, there's a greater incidence of problems which affect yields. Um, and again, as agronomists, I think uh, you have a key role in, in, in limiting these across, uh, across all businesses. And finally, that um, several profit draggers like diseases, uh, lack of nutrition, uh, resistance in weeds and poor weed control all had to bring down yields by that 20 or 30 per cent, and that can mean up to upwards of 100 per cent uh, losses in profitability. One of the key things I think we need to focus on, and part of what I'd like to talk about first, is an ability to be able to sit down and talk to growers and demonstrate the impact of yield across their businesses. And through my years of consulting, um, I've probably the first to put my hand up and say that uh, water use efficiency has been a tool in the north that I think has been largely impractical and I probably didn't support it greatly. Uh, our work in this project has led me to believe that it's probably something we need to look at and revisit as advisors um, and even more so that when we start to talk to people in the industry about what sort of water use efficiency calculations they're doing and how they're using them, we're actually ending up with sort of three or four different methods of calculating it. And I'd like to propose that we, we need to revisit this simply for the reason that it allows us uh, to uh, help our clients make better decisions across, across the board. So the first thing I'd like to say about water use efficiency, is it of use in the northern farming system? Well, I'd have to say its probably greatest impact is help people to estimate what the potential crop returns is. That is, what is attainable at any point of time? We're starting with low subsoil moisture, or we're starting with a full profile. What sort of yield attainable, what's the attainable yield that we should be able to generate from, from those sorts of starting positions? 
Secondly, I think it's important that we have a standardised method so that we can assist in planning uh, and the economics of planting inputs such as nitrogen. So trying to tailor those nitrogen decisions with what the, what the potential attainable yield might be. And thirdly, that we can use it to uh, examine and benchmark actual uh, performance of, of the result and review the, the year as it was and, say the, and work through the issues and look at some of the profit draggers that might have been experienced so that we can demonstrate the economic value of that back to the client. And again, um, one of the things that has become evident from our work is that we need to understand the limitations of water use efficiency. We all understand what a great September rain might do to a winter crop yield. So we need to understand that and make practical adjustments um, where possible over that period of time. Firstly, using water use to know what is attainable. So here's some data from four different locales across the Northern Grains region, and it's really looking at uh, starting plant available water on average, calculated from Rain Man data, over 100 years worth of data, and then looking at, again, the average in-crop rainfall that is occurring across those farms um, over that period of time, and then looking at harvest soil water, which is just an average that has been derived by Epsom, which says on average we're leaving 30 to 20 mils of water left in uh, the soil at harvest time, uh, to give us uh, an average yield for these re regions using some water use efficiency um, quotients that we've um, applied to them over the period of time. They have been compared with Epsom trial data over the same sort of data set over 100 years, just looking at what the attainable yield might be on average over a period of time. And I think you can see from that analysis that, that uh, by using that sort of calculation, we actually can get quite close to what we call long-term attainable yields and that they match up quite well with what Epson's been modelling over that period of time. Uh, again, for sorghum, the same sort of data set, same sort of treatment. Planting soil water estimates based on long-term rain man data, uh, calculations of in-crop rainfall, that should say from um, October to, to uh, March over that period of time, uh, and again an estimate of harvest soil water and applying water use efficiency factors to give us some yield uh, averages for different locales uh, against Epsom model data for soils of different plant available water capacity. Again, a little bit of noise there between them, but in, in general reflecting quite well um, within the scope of uh, what Epsom would be predicting over the, that period of time. So there's a fair argument that by using pretty simple calculations, we can really start to derive what is an attainable yield for, for our clients going forward in different circumstances. So we could be varying the soil, soil water moisture starting, uh, we could vary the uh, in-crop rainfall based on climate outlook, uh, and we can vary things like the water use efficiency factor as, we go, uh, as I'll discuss shortly in a minute. How do we calculate these water use efficiency factors? And I think this is where we're sort of looking at saying, well, maybe we should get some uniformity in how we do this. At the moment, we have some people deducting a third of their in-crop rainfall, some people deducting the 110 mils, and others deducting none. Some people using uh, tools like How Wet to help them predict um, starting water, uh, and others um, just using a fallow efficiency type an arrangement to do that. I think there's an important issue is, we're suggesting that we calculate this using a starting soil water position of 150 mils, um, for instance, as a starting plus 200 mils of in-crop rainfall, minus 30 mils, which is left after harvest. And again, that will vary a big, big rainfall just prior to harvest, would mean that we'd probably deduct more at that period of time to give us 320 mils of plant available water times 12 kilos gives us an attainable yield of 3.84 tonnes. So it's really important that we need to account for some things that are, are a bit unique to the northern region. And the first is to account for soil moisture at planting and harvest, even if it's only an estimate. And we've got some great tools, and I noticed on the program um, there's, a, there's a discussion about a, a new way of estimating soil moisture at any point of time as well, which should be of interest for this sort of work. Also, we believe there's no point in deducting 110 mils for evaporation um, because it distorts the water use efficiency in low year, rainfall years, and I'll look at some data for that in a minute. Um, and we also need to think about using water use efficiency, which varies with yield potential and time of planting. 
that is later planting can affect water use quite dramatically. Why not deduct 110 mils? Well, I think we've had a great example of that in the last 12 months. What happens in a dry year, like 2013 or 14, if we start with 150 millimetres of starting soil water and we get 50 mils of in-crop rain, that equals 200 mils. If we yielded two tonne of the hectare, this gives us a water use efficiency of 10 kilos per hectare per millimetre. If 100 mils is deducted as a, as a calculation for evaporation from the 200, the water use goes straight up to 20 kgs per hectare per year. And this leads to the idea that water use efficiency is actually high in a dry year. If we look at the data, that what we've done here is overlay our, our data runs um, for water use efficiency uh, with harvest index um, from the absent modelling. And what it, what it basically indicates is that as yield increases, so we've got yield along the bottom here, ranging from zero through to eight tonne, uh, and water use efficiency on the y-axis going from two through to 20 kilos per hectare of 100 millimetres of rainfall. Uh, and the red dots are the water use efficiency numbers and the green dots are the harvest index. In other words, how, how much of the plant biomass is being converted to grain yield. And what we're seeing in low yielding years, yields of less than two tonne, water use efficiency is matching quite well with harvest index over that period of time. And as the yield increases, so does the water use efficiency over that period of time. And this led us to this issue about not deducting the 100 mils, so we're reflecting low water use efficiency in low yielding years and high water use efficiency in higher yielding years. So why does harvest index increase the yield? It's simply because in dry year, most of your moisture is, uh, is used by, up by flowering time and there's very little left for grain, flip, grain fill. We often see a lot of tillers dying um, where the energy's gone into growing those tillers. Um, and obviously in a, year, in, a, in a good year, we see uh, multiple tillering uh, and a lot of heads per square metre. And obviously we've also got that grain filling aspect where in good years we've got plenty of plump grains with lots of weight in them. Um, so we're generally getting higher rainfall. With, high, with higher rainfall, we're getting higher moisture. If we look at that data across the AgriPath benchmarking data set and also uh, a combination of the national vendor trials data, which tend to be run under pretty good agronomic control conditions. Uh, we've been through the AgriPath data set and looked at our top performing farms and tried to line them up and chart water use efficiency versus yield over a period of time to see what that looks like. And what we've got here is the sorghum yields um, for the northwest region versus um, water use efficiency on the bottom running from zero to uh, 22 kilos per millimetre and up the side yields running from 1,000 to 10,000 kg, kgs per hectare and we've got a correlation there of, of water use efficiency at about 72.72 R squared which is quite a high correlation but it also says that in years where we've got low, low yields then water use efficiency should be lower in, the, in that environment and in years of high yields uh, water use efficiency uh, should be more like 16 kgs per hectare. So we're, we're advocating that there's a range of yields that we need to, to, to apply, uh, water use efficiency factors that we need to apply uh, when yields are varying across, across the board. Similar sort of data for wheat, probably not as high a correlation, um, but in general, water use efficiency at uh, 10 kgs per hectare in lower yielding years, using the formula that I've suggested, and rising to 15 kilos in the high performing years and averaging about 12 and a half kilos per millimetre per hectare. Now I think some of the variance that comes from that is, is that wheat is one of those crops that probably has more harvest impact. So we've got downgrading, uh, lodging, those sorts of issues that can occur at harvest, uh, which is bringing some of that noise in around those areas. And that means that it, at times, from a practical point of view, we might need to adjust our calculations to understand what's going on in, in that environment. How do we get some of this data? Uh, we obtained that, as I said, a lot of it from, one, the National Vendor Trial data, which tends to be operated under good agro agronomic conditions, and also by looking at our top performing farms in that, over, that, over a period of five years to understand what sort of, what was 
what sort of yield outcomes they were getting in different environments over different times. So this is just an aggregation of the data. So we've, in, in the first example in the high rainfall area of northern New South Wales, we've used um, 33.4 tonnes a hectare is the average yield of our better performing clients and that translated to an 11.9 kilos per hectare of water use efficiency and that involved 44 entries uh, and the equivalent trial data from the Vendel trials was, was another 34 entries which gave us 78 entries to give us an average yield of 3.7 tonnes per hectare or an average water use efficiency of 12.7. Uh, so that's what we've done in each of the different regions to try and come up with uh, some of these water use efficiency factors that we can use going forward. I think it's important that we understand the practical implications and I think this is one of the reasons in the past why, why we have struggled with water use efficiency as a way of measuring performance and being able to sit down and have a discussion with clients about what is economic, what is attainable and what, what impact does that have economically to the business going forward if we make that decision compared to making another decision. And that is things like wheat yield. We know that wheat yield potential declines at around 5% per week past the optimum planting dates. And if water use efficiency is about 12 kilos per hectare per millimetre in mid-May, that means it's going to decline to about 8 kilos by the end of June. And similarly for sorghum, um, it may be around 15 kilos for a high uh, starting water and, and early plant, but if we start to go later than that, then it's going to drop to 12 because of the incidence of heat and the environment that we're in over that period of time. I think what happens with this, if we can start measuring and using water use efficiency as a way of trying to understand how well we performed or what might be attainable in, in each situation that we're analysing going forward, then it really becomes quite evident that two or three problems can lose 30%, you can lose 30% of the yield potential and that translates to more than 60% of the profit when you look at straight economics. What we've got here is some examples between our top performing farms within a year uh, in the Moree region versus what the average farm uh, achieved over that period of time. So from a wheat perspective, we've got top performing farms achieving a yield of 3.36 tonnes per hectare, the average coming out at 2.35 tonnes per hectare, with an average price of 240. By the time we take out the costs, uh, we get a gross margin at the bottom here, running at about $271 a hectare, compared to $102 a hectare for the, bottom, uh, for the average farm in that group. And similarly with the sorghum, same sorts of issues, 271 to 87, so large differences in profitability because two or three things have dragged down the profit um, uh, drag down the yield and therefore the profit in that environment. And they're the things we call the profit draggers. Part of the project that we're dealing with is trying to understand the economics of those and what impact they have on farm profitability. Just as another example, this is data from the Liverpool Plains in 2012. Just looks at uh, bread wheat cropping margin. Uh, we've got the bottom, and again this is dollars per hectare on this side and yield across the top. Massive range of yields in that particular year. Some farms achieving less than two tonne per hectare and some over six. The average margin being four tonne per hectare, which you'd say, well, that's a pretty profitable crop. Four tonne, I'll take that every day. That delivered a margin of $252 a hectare, where the top performers with an extra two tonne of yield um, delivered a margin of $632 a hectare. So massive increase in profit, threefold increase over that period of time, to the point that uh, Every 10% increase in yield from average to the, towards the top gave an extra 30% increase in margin for the businesses going forward. So small increases in yield can have a massive impact on profit margin at the end of the day. So yield is all about robust farming systems and probably number one, as we all know, is that uh, fallow storage is probably number one. How much moisture do we store in that tank um, at at, at the start of the season uh, leads a long way towards getting a very good yield and that's driven very much by stubble cover and healthy soils. And remembering, as I said, small increases in moisture can give you an extra 500 kilos of grain and in some cases that can double profit. Rotations are an important part of that in terms of how they, in terms of managing disease and weed management. We've heard some of that this morning already. And in some cases, crop choice uh, can have a big impact on the business going forward. Uh, and I think one of the issues that we need to consider and revisit are uh, how, how we choose crops in the sequence. Uh, 
in terms of do we have what we call pillar crops in a sequence that we're aiming to set up because of the value they add to a cropping sequence. So a pillar crop in my view would be say a crop of wheat, which is a last winter crop planted before we go back to a long fallow, back to a summer crop so that we've got plenty of stubble cover to uh, enable us to um, establish that summer crop. And what we know from our data is that top performing farmers get these things right. They make decisions that are good for this year, but they're also making that decision um, on the basis of next year and the year after as well. Uh, going forward. So they're, they're using their crop sequences to sort out the agronomic issues, to get the weed issues right, uh, the disease issues right um, for this crop plus the next crop and the crop after. They manage crown rot and nematodes um, with rotation so they don't become an issue. When we look at those bottom performing farms in the Liverpool Plain, all, nearly all of them were weed on wheat um, as a result of that year where they just didn't get the yield expression. They avoid low profit margins with planting decisions based on soil moisture. And this is probably a particularly relevant over the last two years where starting soil moistures, particularly in the western things, have been quite difficult. And again, I think water use and trying to understand what is attainable and what that impact on farm profitability might be uh, can have a big role to play in helping you articulate the issues and the risks that the farmers are taking in each environment. So here's an example of some chickpeas that were double cropped after sorghum in the Moree region. Um, and that chickpea crop was then followed by a wheat crop over that period of time. And that same grower uh, fallowed some country through instead of, after the sorghum, instead of planting the chickpeas, uh, just went to wheat on long fallow over that period of time. So the resultant yield and margins were that the yield for the chickpeas was 1.2 tonne to the hectare, and that delivered a $54 a hectare gross margin. The yield for the following wheat crop after those chickpeas was 2.7, and that delivered $154 a hectare gross margin for that business, which is reasonable. But when you look at it from a comparison of a wheat crop actually being long fallowed and not planting that chickpea crop, that crop generated a margin of $405 a hectare based on the fact that it was utilising the extra 100 odd mils that were stored in the, in the ground uh, which was taken up by that chickpea crop, which did not deliver a high profitable, uh, profitability situation. So the impact on not planting the chickpeas and taking the advantage of the, eight, the additional 95 mils of stored moisture in the long fallow resulted in doubling of the gross margin. When we look at that from a farm profitability point of view and start to understand that for each of these farms in that region, we have a $78 a hectare overhead cost that we have to cover after the gross margin and that the average farm has an $82 a hectare interest bill on top of that, it means that the chickpea contributed minus $106 a hectare for that year and the wheat, the resultant wheat crop after it, after all the costs, uh, delivered minus six, where the long fallow to wheat over a long period with the extra yield um, plus some additional cost uh, in the system and taking up the fact that it had to cover the overhead for two years and the interest cost for two years delivered a margin of $85 per hectare. So sometimes activity does not equal profitability. And that's one of the key messages we need to take home as advisors, that we need to ensure that when, we, when we're going about our activities that there is some profitability involved in, in, in that outcome. How do farmers produce these top yields? Um, Look, there are a lot of people in this audience that know a lot more about this stuff than I do, but it's really about maximising opportunities for legumes and break crops in their sequences um, and making sure that they use those crops to help them control grass weeds so that in their in-crop wheat, for instance, they're doing very little in-crop grass sprays in their wheat because they're dealing with them either in the fallow, using summer crops um, or, getting, or getting cheaper control uh, through their break crop periods of time. Um, there are actually, we can use this data also to manipulate how we think about nitrogen. So here's some example using water use efficiency and starting to think about the impact of climate outlook uh, with three, two different starting positions of 80 mils and 160 millimetres of starting water and with different climate outlooks. So minus, minus five for the SOI in August to September region, average, as it's September months averaging minus five and plus five. And the impact on nitrogen rates um, and varying the water use efficiency based on the outlook, given that 
In lower yielding years, we think water use efficiency will be lower. In higher yielding years, we're using a higher water use efficiency factor. We can see that nitrogen requirements for the crop vary from 45 to 61 kilos in a low starting moisture period and from 76 to 97 kgs in a, in a higher starting moisture period. So we can use this sort of information to help us make better decisions going forward. Obviously, plant establishment, very important to get good reliable strikes. Um, obviously, again, top performing farmers by using pillar crops, understanding that the crop they plant this year is going to impact on the profitability of the next crop and next year and the crop after that and the crop after that. We can start to utilise some of the tools like deep planting of uh, chickpeas and those things to get things planted on time uh, and to, to utilise machinery more, more effectively over the period of times. And often now with the technology we've got, we're producing crops where we would have never have. And we've got people in the western areas around Canamble and Walgett last year on long fallow produced 2.6 tonnes to the hectare on their long fallow and their short fallow stuff that was planted on very low moisture averaging about 0.5. So massive differences in our ability and I think the in-crop rainfall was about 35 millimetres. So amazing what we can do when we get the technology and the systems right going forward. Obviously it's important to get it in the paddock and some of the work that we're seeing and some of the uh, variance around the means for water use efficiency in wheat is really about harvest management and it becomes a real yield dragger when we're leaving um, either chickpeas too late or we're not doing a good job of getting our cereals off and drying and utilising those sorts of uh, the technology that's now there in grain storage to help us pick up a few more dollars in that output. I think I'll leave it there. In water, in summary, water use is a tool I think that can now be used to assist in planning and understanding what is attainable and benchmarking actual yield. I think it's important as advisors that we help people understand the impact of yield, drive, yield draggers and what impact they actually have on farm profitability. 10 to 20 per cent drop in yield can halve the profit for most businesses. What we do know is from our benchmarking data and the analysis of the data is that top performers, that's what they're good at. They limit the impact of yield draggers through good planning. They generally have good crop sequences that enable them to fix the agronomic issues such as disease and nutrition as they go forward um, for their businesses. And I think management is a key role in that in terms, and us as advisors need to be able to sit down and have those sorts of discussions with people in terms of what impact they have on profitability. And I think to do that, rotations have a big part to play because they actually are a natural fit in helping people address some of those yield dragging issues. Thank you.